this is an investigation of a personal question. I've lived, well, I grew up in New England and I've lived in the Boston area for um, about 10 or 11 years now. And I have the feeling that the winters have been getting warmer and that we used mm -hmm. to have, you know, we used, I'm feeling like it used to be common to have a week where it just barely got above freezing for the whole week and that that hasn't happened very much. Till actually this winter, there has been some um, extended periods of cold. Um, so I wanted to just get some data and look at it and try to investigate that. And I thought I'd share that with you. And um, I started out trying to put together a nice Zaringan presentation where I could step through and, you know, show stuff. And I'm not very good at that. <laughs> and I'm not familiar with it. And I thought, well, this is supposed to be how I work and how I work is generally in an R script, editing the script as I go and watching, um, watching the plots change. And so I'm not gonna quite live code. I, I put the steps in, but it's gonna be a little bit closer to how I actually work as opposed to um, making a polished presentation. So that's my research question. This is pretty much the first line of every script I write. I'm definitely a Tidyverse uh, fanboy. There's um, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, has very detailed weather data available for from weather stations all around the country. Um, I downloaded 10 years of weather data for Logan Airport, which is uh, Boston Logan Airport is very close. I'm not going to show the details of that. I just did it through their website. And 10 years is the most you can download. And I wanted to get full winter. So I actually have um, from December 2012, I think, to um, March 2021. And I'll just load that data uh, with read CSV. And let's take a look. And so the first thing is like, Oh my gosh. So there's 124 columns in here. This is, this is a lot of data. And just scrolling through the columns, well, it's kind of weird. There's a daily average dew point and dry bulb temperature. So that looks promising, but there's a lot of NAs in there. In fact, there's really a lot of NAs. There's occasional values. Um, so the quest, first question is, all right, what's going on with there? Um, so yikes, that was my reaction. And just looking at the names, um, it's also a nice way to see, okay, so there's, I, wet, I don't want wet bulb temperature, that has to do with humidity, I want the, um, so there's average dry bulb temperature, maximum dry bulb temperature, minimum dry bulb temperature, so that looks pretty good. Um, so now I went to the data dictionary to try to figure out what all these rows are, and I won't, make you slog through that, it's quite, actually two large documents, but the interesting parts was this report type field is the type of weather observation. There's a whole separate file that actually has the code book, but it calls out this SOD, the summary of day report from the weather station. So then I just took a look at the report type and okay, so there's 3,400 SOD entries. That sounds kind of promising. So next thing, I just filtered by the report type and just picked a few, the columns that look interesting. So the date, and then this is a regular expression, anything that matches daily something and dry bulb temperature. So this will get the minimum, maximum, and average dry bulb temperature. Now let's take a look at that. Okay, so this looks a lot more uh, manageable. It has nice dates, it has no NAs, it has the three temperature columns that I'm interested in. So making progress. Um, back to here. Now I want a real date. So get the Lubridate package, which is part of the Tidyverse, but not loaded with Tidyverse directly. And um, so I want to, oh, so this is duplicate. So this I've duplicated because really what I would have done here is just add some more lines up here if I was live coding. Um, so this now sort of pretend that I just took this and added in a few more lines. So pick out the date with uh, YMDHMS 
pull the year out of the date, select the year, the date, and then rename those three fields to um, have some shorter names. So now I should have a year, a date, which you can't tell, but this is now as a date format rather than text, and the three temperatures of interest. All right, now we can start plotting. So let's just do a basic line plot um, by year. It's like, okay, well, so there's some obvious problems. I want these all to line up. I don't want the whole year. I just want the winter. I want the December 2011 to actually be matched up with January, February, March of 2012. So got some work to do. And also, oh, I guess I didn't restart, but I should um, normally, okay. So this would have actually had name default. No, what is the name of the default theme, anybody? Classic, I think. No, I don't know, gray. Anyway, I didn't reset the theme, but I don't care for the default theme. It's very busy. So I generally go with the minimum theme, which is what's actually shown here. It doesn't have nearly as many lines. It doesn't have the gray background. It's just a little cleaner um, theme. I don't know, am I going a good pace? Too fast, too slow? Anybody have questions? Okay. <laughs> Thank speak you. up if you if you have a question, speak up, and I'll just keep uh, keep plowing ahead. Sure. So now I wanted to filter out just the winter months. Um, so the the month function in Lubridate will pull the month out, and I just want December, January, February, March, and the Y day is the the ordinal day within the year from one to three sixty six. So that will let me line up um, the dates without um, without scattering them across like this. So let's just get the winter months and try that. So that's better. I still have December on the right and January on the left, and that's not quite how I want. Um, so this is, oh, so I wanna, so first I just said, well, what's the first year day of December in the data set? And it's 335. So I'm gonna now just kind of do a little hacking where First of all, I make the season be the date plus a month so that the December 2011 will show up in the 2012 season and make a label so it says season. So it'll be 2011 to 2012. And then um, mangle the day if it's bigger than 335, subtract 365 so it goes back to the beginning. And this actually probably should be 366 because I'm sure there's some leap years in here, um, but I'll just leave it for now. So now we should be able to get a little bit better plot. So now we have actually day within the season. We've got the seasons here. We're showing um, just something like 60 days within the um, year. So it's getting to be showing the data that I'm actually interested in, but I wanna see, okay, where is it cold and how does that compare? So the next thing I did was throw some reference lines in with GMH line. Um, so there's reference lines for uh, 20 degrees and 32 degrees. This is Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Fahrenheit is freezing, zero degrees centigrade. 20 degrees Fahrenheit is, I don't know, 12, 12 degrees Fahrenheit below, which is gonna be what, something like five, minus five centigrade, I think something roughly. So anyway, um, but those are those are kind of obnoxious red lines. So then I just went in and made them a little smaller. I think my original time of this actually used alpha, but it, this, this time through I'm using size. Um, so now they're sort of better. So now we can start to eyeball in here. Um, this season, yeah, there's not really any serious cold. There's a little bit here. There's, I think this one, so here's a pretty big cold spell where the average temperature is below freezing for an extended period of time. This one has a super long one up here. But then, all right, these are average temperatures. So do I wanna look at average or minimum or maximum? So again, if I was live coding, well, actually I can do this. We could just throw in min here and look at the min. There's the minimum temperature. So 
here's a really long period where actually the minimum was below 20 for like a long time. So there's yeah, definitely- And that, that was actually one of the bad winters that Boston had seen. Um, yeah. That was the first time my, my husband was here and that's exactly uh, when it was like, you just couldn't go out for months. Yeah, it was really cold. <laughs> I don't remember that one specifically, but here's another one that looks pretty long, 27, 2018. Yeah, and if we look when at I them, was in school and I used to travel every day by train. Oh no. <laughs> if you look at the maximum temperature, well, this one is still pretty cold. So it barely got above freezing at all during this period. Mm -hmm. And this one, the maximum was down below 20 for several days. Um, so this is just doing the same thing. And then I thought, well, let's just put both. So GM ribbon is a nice thing. And let's just do ribbon with maximum mm -hmm. minimum. So this is now actually showing the temperature range mm -hmm. um, over these periods. And yeah, you can see it was really cold back here and it was pretty cold here. There haven't really been extended periods like that since then. But it's a little hard to tell what's going on still. Like these are days and it's like, this is 25 days. And it was kind of like, my gut feeling was like, it used to be really cold for a week at a time. So I wanted to see weeks. So I just changed the X axis now with um, scale X continuous, just putting in some, some breaks. And I'm not quite sure how I decided to start with minus 28, but they're just going every two weeks. So now these major breaks are showing every two weeks and the minor breaks are showing weeks. So you can, going back here, it's like, well, one, two, three, four. It's like five weeks when it didn't get above freezing. That's that's really cold, even for here. And here there's um basically two weeks where it didn't even barely got above 20 degrees. And the 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 uh, minimum it was the minimum was below 20, even way below for two weeks. So those are two good ones. So I'm starting to feel like, yeah, this is showing what I want to see. And really there hasn't been an extended cold snap since maybe 27, 2018. There doesn't seem to be anything here or here, but there's still a little cleanup. Um, so for my own use, this is, I think this is about where I stopped when I was doing this for oh, myself. I have a question. Um, so when, yeah. when you're looking at these different years, uh, so this is weeks and, um, is there a way to sort of add maybe a month label also? Though I guess it is intuitive, but it like it might be easier if you could just see this is December, this is January. Yeah, hmm. probably the thing to do would be to to label the these with dates instead of just days. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And I've kind of well, I do. I think I still have it in my data set. Oh yeah, the date uh, you could probably yeah, pull out so, the um, day month with, and then format yeah, it as so, percentage B. Let's see. Let's just copy this. That's where we are. So I wanted to take. Oh well. Yeah, I'm not sure if I can. I think I probably would want to put a formatted date. I'm not quite sure. I think I have to do probably a little wrangling mm -hmm. to do that. We'd because, have to create a different call month column. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I'm I'm using the season day as the mm -hmm. aesthetic, so that and you need to make a label mm -hmm. that corresponds to the season day. Sure. Okay, then we can we can probably move on. That's yeah, okay. I'm not quite sure offhand how to do that. It's a good idea. Um, zero, I think, is basically January 1st. Mm. So it's roughly January, February, March, and then negative ones are December. But yeah, it'd be nice. Well, of course, actually, the dates are going to be different. No, they should be the same. Yeah, good point. No, I didn't do that. But I did go ahead and clean up the axes a little bit. Um, so the first thing is just to put some labels. Mm. Next label, it's sort of weak. Oh, and I did change them to be Right, let's not actually start at minus 28. Let's just at least start the week labels at zero. <laughs> so it's showing days kind of from the beginning and labeled X with week and Y with daily temperature range give 
descriptive title, title and subtitle and a caption to show the, um, the data source. So this is more like if I was going to actually publish this someplace, I would want to have better labels. And I always yeah. try to credit where the data has come from. And then really these Y axis labels are just too busy. So I took those out because they were not really um, contributing much. And it's still, it's a little crowded, but um, I think that's pretty good. Um, you know, that's, that's at a stage that I would feel okay, you know, publishing it informally, which is the, basically how I do, you know, with my, um, my personal projects. This one I have not published, but that would be, I think, good enough for, um, you know, to show to uh, friends or other interested parties. Um, so then I went into something else. So I'll stop for a second, just see if there's any other questions or comments so far. Uh, June has a suggestion on um, changing the offset uh, that you're talking about. Uh, in the chat? Yeah, in the chat, yeah. Um, I don't actually know how to see that right now. Oh, chat. Ah. Uh, I could try that. Let's see. So going back to here and putting in this, taking out, taking out these. Uh, doesn't like the offset, and it's doesn't it's know that it's a document for offset. Yeah, I think I have to. I probably have to have a date on the as, as the aesthetic mm -hmm. to use as a date scale. Yeah, yeah, that makes um, sense. And so then, well, what happens if? Yeah, then it's going to start putting. December on the right side again. Um, I think I probably need to just manufacture some labels that have the date that I want. Um, but I don't think I want to live code that. <laughs> sure. Yeah, June can try it. You say. Yeah. Um, well, I have to give him the give him the data. I suppose. I don't know. Is there an easy way to share that? Well, in all in the whole thing, I could I could try it later. It's a good idea, definitely, yeah. to label them with the date. Um, so then I thought, well, okay, can I quantify this? You know, actually count up the numbers. You know, how long are the runs of days with temperatures below freezing? Um, so there's this, there's an RLE function in R which does compute run length that you can give it a data set and it will divide it up into runs of the same length and give you a, a, a list with the length of the run and then the value of the run. So I'm not gonna go through this in too much detail. It took me a little, quite a bit of thrashing actually to get this to work because I tried to do it just with group by and it didn't work. But if I group by season and then nest, so I have a, da a data frame with each season, then I can mutate across that and uh, map this, this mess, which is basically applying RLE on the maximum less than 32. So I've got true and false values for how cold it was um, and computing the RLEs and then a little bit of ugly mangling to turn it into a data frame that's going to have um, values and length values. Then I can get rid of data. I don't need that anymore and unnest cold and filter it for just the runs that had true values, which is the runs that were less than 32 degrees. So let's do that. And then we can just take a quick look at what that looks like. Let's do it here. So for each season, I've got all the runs in that season and how long they were. So 2012, not so much. We should go to the 20, so here's a run of seven days, 2014, five days, 15 days in the 2014, 2015. So that's the 
long one we were looking at where it didn't get above freezing at all for 15 days. Um, so let's try to take a look at that. So the first thing, just, uh -oh, what did I, what did I do here? I did this, right? I should do this. This is back to, let's just clear out all the plots. That's a bad error from something. No. Oh, did I come? Oh, okay. oh, I'm, all right. This doesn't have. Oh, I should have done it by season. I so I I added the season label after the fact, and it's not in this. But actually, that's what I should do here. Just change this, and then I'll have the nice label. Hopefully, I'm not totally ruining this. There we go. So there's a basic histogram, very basic. So the first thing with histograms is you pretty much never want the default bin width, but it's nice to do it once to get an idea. Generally, I can pick something from knowing something about the data. You can say, oh, you know, we want to bin by pick a width. And here, clearly the, the number of the length, the number of days of um, cold is the proper thing to bin by. So here it is now, bin by length. And here's this 2014, 2015 winter with the 15-day uh, cold snap. And there's about a 13, 14-day one in 27, 2018. Did have one here. So it does look, again, like there have been some shorter ones. So again, let's clean this up a bit. So um, did sort of do this by pieces. Um, change the scale to show weeks again. So now this is seven days of cold. So here's three, only actually three winters that had seven days, but here's probably six and some five, some shorter ones. And then, oh, and I guess I put the labels in consecutive days, occurrences and the title and a caption showing where it comes from. And then the last thing was again, just to take out some of the lines that uh, don't really help any, or the labels rather, the axis text and the minor grid lines. So again, this is something that is finished to sort of basically how far I usually get. It's, it's descriptive, it's clear. It's not, generally presentation is not my strong point. Oh, Generally, you know, making I can make things readable. I can show what I want to show. I'm not great at graphic design. So this is sort of usually where I stop. And it is where I stopped with this one. Um, so that's that's the end. If anybody has questions, more questions or suggestions, I'm I'm happy to answer anything. Otherwise, I'm done. Uh, yeah, I, I do want to um, ask a question, and maybe you missed it. I was just distracted for a minute in between. Um, I, I do want to ask, like, so, um, especially because given this is now only 14 days of cold, how how did you uh, read this? So when, when you said run length, I, my understanding was you're trying to look at how many times did you and and what was the like what was the length of um, you know cold consecutive cold days, and right. and how many times did you get that in in a given week? Is that how? I don't know. I think my no in a given season. Right. So so this is saying that the, that there were fourteen consecutive days of cold. So the run length is finding consecutive days. So if you look at go back to the data, let's see. Let's look good. 2013, 2014, that's got a lot of, a lot of runs in it. Um, so you can see here, there was a single day, there were five days in a row of cold, three days of cold, four days of cold. So these are all separate instances that if we went back to the original graph, uh, which I deleted because I was having trouble, um, but we should be able to come back up here and redo this last one. 
So 2014, 2015, no, 2013, 2014, we're looking at, right? Or yeah, 13, 20, 14. 20, or no, wait. You said 2013, 14, so. 2013, 14, right. So if we look, 2013, 14, so here's a couple days of cold. Here's, this is look maybe five days, maybe three days, maybe mm -hmm. four days. Here's a, a long one. Um, here's a couple of short ones. So each of those is a separate instance in the run length. So we, and uh, how are we defining the cold days here? Anything that goes below 20? No, here I said, um, so that's here where I said oh, that 32. the maximum Anything temperature is less than 32. So actually below freezing. So this below is the red top red line. Right. So this is consecutive days where the maximum temperature was below freezing mm -hmm. as, as measured at Boston Logan Airport. Mm -hmm. And so like the... Um, was it the, uh, so the 2014, 2015, that's the one that's got this uh, one gigantic 15 day, one. Oh. 15 days where it didn't get above freezing at all for 15 days. So that's all, so the original, um, if, I, if I just look at this one without filtering, um, that might help a little bit. You can see this has runs of, uh, let me put that into, into view. Oh, and- um, so This has runs question, of- yeah. a, So when, when you are doing this, uh, so is the group by automatically doing the arrange in, in the sense that, you know, in that order of days, it actually happened when, when, you're, when you're seeing the true false values? Um, well, the group by was by season. And then within here, these are gonna be in order, yes. Um, if you look at the raw data, this is saying that 2011, 2012 had 17 days where it was above freezing, one day below, five days above, one day below, 10 days above. So these are the, there's a run of 17 false values where here false means that it was not below freezing. Then there was one day of true, oh. one instance of true values, five so instances is it of that false. A, so, uh, so in terms of how that code works, is it, and then probably that it's that hourly function. So it first sees, um, you know, like just the true false for every actual, actual everyday date. Yes. And then run length function will, um, we'll say when when that changes, when whenever that switch happens, that's when it, it reports here. Yes. Okay. So, so it's cool. it's counting up the consecutive runs and giving me um, how long the run is and then what was the value in the run. And oh. here the value is just true false because okay. I just put in the threshold. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Cool. Yeah, and then yeah, let's let's talk about the the next um, that histogram uh, chart that you had made. Uh, sure. So then this is showing. So then I filtered out because I only care about the runs where it was cold. Mm -hmm. So in the actual runs data, I filtered out all the values of false because false, the way I define it, this is what I'm actually counting up runs of. And this is a, a function. So the dot x is just the um, is the data, which is the nested data frame right. for yeah. the temperature. So I'm looking at run lengths of the maximum temperature less than 32. So less than 32 is true, greater than or equal to 32 is false. Um, and then I filter for just, and this run length encoding, I should, if I just, let's say, so let's do something like, um, I could say x equals this, and then say data equals x dollar data one. And then we could take a look at data. So this is gonna be the data. So this is the data for one season. Okay. So it's looking at, so here the maximum temperature it's pretty high actually, the beginning of December this season. So this is the 17 days above freezing. Then there's one day below. Mm -hmm. 
here. Oh, yes, yes. And there's um, one, two, three, four, five days above. So that's what's showing up. Yeah. Here's 17, one, five. Mm -hmm. Those are the runs that it's counting. Um, and then another really long day above, or long one above, which is <laughs> 10. So there's not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of true values in here because it was a warm winter. But that's what it's counting is these, how many, and we could actually put, um, uh, so this is what it's counting in the run length encoder. So there's a long mm. one of false, then there's one true, there's another one of false, one true, a lot of false, another true, not very many trues in here. Uh, if we went down to a more interesting season, oh, well, this is just that one season because that's what I pulled out, but that's what the run length encoding is counting. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so then I get this these runs. And so then I was interested in, well, how many, what's the distribution of the run length for you know, short runs versus long runs? And that's what the histogram shows. So, um, you know, these are pretty, sh pretty short runs this, this winter. Okay. This, this is, I haven't labeled this, but this is going to be like six, five, four, three, mm -hmm. two, I guess there's no zero. So uh, this is okay. runs of, this is, single this is one, days. this is one, this is one. Yeah. One. This is a single day of cold, two days of cold, yeah. three days of cold. Um, there weren't really a lot of runs of cold at all compared to like this winter, which oh, okay. had. Yeah. So, lot. so the more, uh, the more spots are we seeing across this, that means the more number of cold days there were. So basically, if everything is on the first, the one, which means, you know, this season we only had one, like, uh, hot, like the basically the switch from hot to cold to hot basically was only once, but then yeah. so many, most of the times it was just one day of cold, which is, you know. Yeah, like this winter looks like there's maybe two or three times when there was a, a single day of cold and one time when there were two days of cold mm -hmm. so there's hardly any cold at all in this right. winter versus up here where not only were there a lot of single days or a lot of two day there were yeah. some two days and three days and four days and five days and even seven days of cold so there was over overall i mean i, I could have you know, just a couple of instances of that so if within yeah. four months there were um two three four maybe six seven patches of regular consecutive day cold days and then 2014-15 that you saw that there was one patch of 15 days when it was absolutely yeah. consecutively um below zero yeah 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 i mean i guess something else i could have done that might have been interested is just count up the cold days without doing the run length and that would just get a single number for each um for each season or actually you could make an, maybe an interesting plot showing the accumulative numbers of days below each temperature mm -hmm. might be interesting. But it, my original question really was about extended periods of cold. So that's that's why I did the analysis this way. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, but the question, it, it, it pretty much answers that, right? So in, in 2014-15, there was there were a few multiple con, con, many consecutive days, but more of them. Uh, I mean, the previous year saw also many um, days at a stretch, including a week of cold weather. But yeah. the extreme was in 2014, 15, and then 17, 18 that we already talked about. But it was this just one in this case in 17, 18. There was one very long one here. One two week patch. Otherwise, yeah. you know. Yes. Yeah. It's kind of interesting because it was not a very cold winter other than that. Mm -hmm. um, there, you know, there's maybe six, I don't know, I took the, took the labels off the, the mm -hmm. y-axis. Maybe that wasn't the best, the best yeah. um, answer. Uh, but know. I think it was um, 0, 20, 40, 60 for the y-axis. Um, no, not in this. Oh, way. sorry. This is, okay. This is counts. So yeah, this is counts. We back. could just put those back on. Um, yeah, if I just yeah, uh, access access this much. Yeah. Okay. 
There we go. Yeah, that's better. So this one, that looks like three days. So there were three single days and three pair double days, and then this one 15 day or 13 day streak. Yeah. So I don't know. You can read into this a lot, whatever you want, I think, really, because here's yeah. this was cold and this winter was but, sort of colder um, than this one. This, this one, that. but this one flip side here, I'm thinking, so what if, I mean, so I, I guess we started with trying to answer how cold the Boston weather has been over the past years, but what if there were, um, like, you know, there were cold days, like one, one cold day, the other was not, second, third day was cold, fourth was not, I mean, just a hypothetical situation. That would still be a cold winter, but it will not show up here in- Well, in, it would show uh, up as, as single days of cold. So like that would oh, be here. Okay, that's- yeah. So like this winter didn't have any really long cold snaps, but it had quite mm -hmm. a few, had six single days of cold and mm. two, two double days of cold and one uh, day of four, four days in a row. Oh, okay. So the y-axis would be pretty high in that case. Yeah, if it, if it just went above and below and above yeah. and below mm -hmm. for the whole winter, you'd have a lot of of um, yeah of single days of cold. Yeah, and um, I don't know. It might be interesting to do this with the minimum temperature and how you know many days where the minimum got below, but. Those aren't necessarily feeling as cold if it gets above freezing during the day. Mm. Um, that's, you know, not quite as <laughs> chilling as if it just it never gets above freezing and things don't thaw at all. Uh, yeah. It would be, yeah, I should. I, yeah, because I think the, yeah, when you said minimum is usually the late nights. So, yeah. Max is a better, uh, yeah. that's the day temperature. Would be interesting to do. I wonder if I could just use there's there's a cumulative distribution function. ECDF. ECDF. Mm -hmm. I wonder because I don't think Ryan S is here. He was gonna. He said he was gonna come late and present. Oh, Ryan. Yeah, he messaged. He's not. He may not be able to join. His meeting is running so, over. Yeah, we can continue. So this would be. Let's see. So let's try to do. Um, if I just do ECDF of my data dollar um, max, what does that look like? And let's call that something, um, probably a bad name, I'll just give it a worse name and then plot that. So here's the cumulative distribution of days of maximum temperature. So we could do something with this. And actually, I think what is, I'm not sure what this is giving me, but it might be nice to do like a, uh, a ridge plot with this. Um, so is this for one year? This is just for that one year that I had already pulled out. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. for the, the very first season. Right. Um, but this ECDF object, what does it really look like? The function. Because uh, oh, really what I want out of here is the, um, the X and Y values. Um, you know, try D dollar and see if something comes up. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's interesting. It's actually a function. Yeah. Um, Oops. Rocks. <laughs> huh. So. So when you type D then, it, oh, okay, this is all it gives. Empirical yeah. CDF and the value. So it's an approx value is. Uh, 
uh, what if I do summary? No. <laughs> oh, it's got an environment. Oh. No, oh, ls, not dir. Okay, so if we try, should be able to do $x, right? Oh, no. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. It should show something in dollar. You need to get the environment of D. And ask for x out of that. Wow. There we go. Lord. And we think y. Of there we go. So, okay. So now we could go something like, so we still want to do this much. Copy that, start over. And let's call this um, distribution. And then for each one, we want to Actually, we should, let's make a function. And that's going to just return a data frame. Uh, well, let's see, so we want first to get, and then which we can even get the environment. Well, sorry, Kent, what does the environment function does? So every function has an environment. Functions are closures and they can remember values from their environment. Like if you, if you have a function that creates a function, for example, um, then any other va values that are in scope when that's created will be in the environment of the function. So this ECDF actually returns a, a function that has an environment with all the information in it that I'm actually trying to get. So I'm gonna get the environment of that data and then I'm gonna pull out the, um, the X and Y values and put them into a data frame. So if I call um, it now. So is this a typo? Um, Kent, so you said x is equal to d dollar x and by dollar y. Uh, thank you. So now if I call that on my example data, oops. Oh, I need to call data dot max. Try that. There we go. So that gives me x's and y's. So now I should be able to um, make a dis, let's call it dister. And we want to map on data to get ECDF. And then we want to uh, delete the data and unnest the uh, dister. Okay, so that gave us for each season, we have X and Y values. So now we should be able to do something like, um, plot dister. I'm just starting out with very basics. Okay, it's a little hard. So what are we showing? So this is actually temperature on the bottom. And this is the number of days where the maximum temperature was below that. 
So actually, you know, this might be nice to just color. And not facet, and then we can more directly compare. It's a little hard to know which is which, but this green, so this is the number of days where the maximum temperature got above that. So the ones on the right, this says, oh, it's actually not the number, it's the fraction of days. So this says a quarter of the, all days. The left y-axis usually represents the percent of value yeah. below this. Right, percent, or it's just called out as a fraction. So 25%. So in this, so the, the cold, the one with a lot of cold days was what, 28, no, 2015, 16? 14, 15. 14, 15. So one of these green ones. Uh, I think uh, the left two green ones are. are uh, because. Oh, the left, at the green most, on the oh, left. Oh, right, so this is saying okay. that 25%, a quarter of the days were below 30. So yeah, okay, so these are the, so these are showing uh -huh. two very cold because they have, um, okay. yeah, quarter of the days below freezing. Mm. So we could put, um, so yeah, I think that's that's the right interpretation or uh, reading that you said. So the these two seem like thirteen, fourteen, and fourteen, fifteen by the color. So there's our thirty-two degrees. So an easy way to make this interactive is to put it into um, Plotly. So we could say, that and then we can check. So this is 2014, 2015. This is 2013, 2014. So they were um, noticeably colder in terms of the number of days. So Days below, uh, below, below freezing, thirty-three. So a third of the, a third of the days, the maximum temperature was below freezing. Those mm -hmm. two seasons. The next one, well, so this is. Um, I don't know. We want to go down. the next most coldest one. Was only eighteen percent of days below freezing. So, in a sense, it was almost twice as cold. Twice, mm -hmm. almost twice as many days below freezing as the yeah. next coldest year. Mm -hmm. So, and let's see, so 2020, the most recent one that I have full data, that's, um, well, that's interesting. The warmest one is actually that 2011, right? Which we saw almost no cold days. 2020 is this purple now. That's probably Not 2019. That purple. Oh, it's way over here. So 20, uh, this one. So it's actually one of the colder, one of the colder ones in terms. Well, we of, don't have twenty the current year, current winter. No, because it's only January. Um, oh and yeah. I'm yeah. going through March. I wanted to okay. mm. get the get the full winter, okay. and also because I can only get ten years of data at a time. Mm -hmm. So, I to get partial twenty. 22 I would have had to lose I would have had to lose mm. partial of 2011 yeah okay. so um yeah that's that's why we have to wait three months to well <laughs> what, two months before we can get March yeah no but I think it will be a good exercise if by end It'll of be interesting to, yeah. yeah and of course I can just add that data you know yeah just need to get one year one year yeah. and just add it in here yeah, this was so, fun. Yeah. Anybody else has any question? I, I really enjoyed this. Here um, we got some actual after. live coding. <laughs> yes, we finally did that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, I love this, um, you know, seeing somebody else talk through what you are doing and why you are doing. Because I feel I'm very a non-creative person in that sense. And 
I find it challenging to think of variety of what else you can do and how you should do it. Yeah. Anybody else has any thoughts? Lydia, you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say thank you. That was actually one of the questions I was going to ask about um, putting them all um, together versus faceting. So I'm glad you guys went ahead and ended up doing that. But actually, so yeah, Kent, how long have you been using like Tidyverse and R? Um, I've been using JG. Well, let's see. I guess I first really started getting into R in 2010. I had used it some before that, but I actually had cancer in 2010. So I was um, basically homebound for several months and strangely enough found that um, the two things that I could still do with my chemo addled brain were learning statistics and crossword puzzles. <laughs> And I know that says something really strange about my brain, but um, that was the case. And my wife, at, well, she was my girlfriend at the time, was taking a statistics class. So I sort of followed along with her class. And so that was a lot of R. I'm not sure. I've been using probably ggplot that long. ggplot predates the tidyverse by quite a bit. There was... Um, before dplyr, there was plyr. There were two versions of plyr. Um, so, and I was using those. So it took me a little while to get into the tidyverse, but pretty much, I mean, when the pipe first came out, I was like, this is too weird. I don't get it. And I don't want to, you know, I'd already switched my method of data wrangling once. So sometimes, sometimes follow, trying to follow Hadley Wickham can be a little, um, you know, feel like you're holding on to the back of a cart that's moving a little faster than you want to be going. So it, it took me a little while, but once I had time to sort out what the pipe was all about, it's like, oh my gosh, this is so much better than, you know, I used to write a lot of code where it would be um, let's see, yeah, I'm still, where, you know, I just make a variable, you know, this would be written something like um, just re reassigning each time, distor equals winter. Well, of course, without the pipe, it would be group by winter season label. And then it would be distor equals um, nest. And it wouldn't have been these verbs because they didn't exist. But you know, a lot of code that looked like um, like this. And so on. Just reassign. So you could you know, run this one and look at it and then run the next one and look at it as opposed to <clears throat> what I'll do now is, you know, I probably, well, not in this case, because this is really only one data wrangling step in here, but pretty often, um, I don't have a good example in here. You know, I'll just write the first step and see what I get and then the second step and then keep adding steps and looking at it. Yeah, yeah. I think one thing I like about uh, piping the best is that I don't have to have multiple variable names to, you know, store right. and then override it and then things like that. So you can yeah. keep testing every single step, add, add to it, add to it, unless exactly. it's exactly. something that really, you know, it's extremely different that makes it extremely different. So, you know, you read one file and then create a new data set and just keep modifying it. Right. And typically, so that, the, the first step might be something time consuming, like reading a big file. Yeah. And then I'll put that as a separate step and rename right. it for the. Because if then you modify the new file, um, you don't want to mess up your original data frame because that takes longer. So you right. want to keep that right. and play around with the next step. And the other thing that the pipe means you don't have to do anymore is, um, you know, just nesting all this stuff. So that you know, might have written this as nest. group yeah. by 
Yeah. By, by data. And that just gets out of hand really quickly. And you're trying to read mm -hmm. things from the inside out. And it's just yeah. really hard. So I guess really that's when I kind of went full tidy versus when deep wire came out in the pipe and tidier. Um, so I don't know how long that's been, but. Yeah, no, but I, I also had my R started um, before Dplyr, uh, before Tidyverse, but I think it was pretty painful until I experienced, um, I think, Dplyr in 2018. I mean, I'm, I'm sure it came in pretty uh, much sooner than that, but I did one um, data camp course at that time, and then I was like, oh, this is so much nicer now. <laughs> yeah, and ggplot, I never like base plotting. I don't like... Yeah. That you have separate lines and you have to say add equals true. And then, you know, like I'm doing the statistical rethinking class. I don't know. I think a few of you are in there and he'll do a plot with no data just to set the limits. And it's like, I don't want to have to do that. Yeah. <laughs> the plotting library should figure out the limits. But in base plot, if you want to add things that have different ranges, you sort of have to figure out the range yourself ahead of time. So. Uh, yeah, I was never ever a fan of base plot. I think I've always been using ggplot. Yeah, um, I think me too. And that hasn't changed dramatically. It's added, but I think the basics of ggplot really haven't changed much since since long ago. Mm -hmm. um, it's gotten a lot richer, but the basics of aesthetics and geom the the basic geoms hasn't really changed. So that's nice. Cool. <laughs> um, all right. So I guess I, I just have one question. Uh, and it we, we may not need to talk about it if we have to run out. But uh, I am I'm wondering, what are the scenarios when you use nest function um, other than probably this one? Um, because what I recently came across was a hoist function and a nest longer and wider. I, I couldn't yeah. wrap my head around so those, many things. Those are really good for like if you have a data set that you got from JSON that's really nested. Mm -hmm. So basic simple nesting like I'm doing, you just have a column where each element is a data frame. But um, the hoist and unnest, the un I'm not an expert on those. There's a there's a tidier vignette that goes into those in detail, and it really is helpful if you have highly nested data, which often is what you get if you're reading JSON. Okay. Um, but yeah, June said something about the second. I actually, not sure, I don't know if I still have it, and I can't get to it and keep my earphones on, but I did it for a while. Have the original ggplot book which was not nearly as easy to understand as the current one that we're going through. <laughs> that has changed a lot. Um, but uh, anyway, yeah, that's, so look at the vignette. Um, let's see which one it is if we go to, and then I'm gonna have to stop because I have a meeting at 1.30 and I have not eaten my lunch yet. Tidier. Yeah, it's, it's this rectangling one. It talks about the unnest longer, wider, and it's working with these crazy um, nested, nested data sets. I don't know, They're, yeah, take a look at that. That's, I, don't, I don't use those because I don't work with that kind of data. But I think if you do have that kind of deeply nested data, like this, I think the Star Wars data in the sample data is something like that. It's really helpful. Okay. All right, well, I have to go. I have to go have lunch. Um, yeah, sure. But I'm glad Thank that you. was helpful. You're that very was welcome. Great. It was. It was. Thank, you, very Thank much. you so much. Good. Thank Good. you, everyone. See you next week. Bye, guys. All right. See you next week. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.